good? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, the people on YouTube will never get these jokes with Jack, so. Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, and with one hand, and the other hand, Mark chapter 7, verse 31. And we're going to be in Matthew, though, most of the time, so. Matthew 15, we're, going to verse, we're starting with verse 29. Prayerfully today, we will definitely finish Matthew 15 and probably start Matthew 16. We'll see how far we get. So, it's good. I see a few people out of town, so. I want to again thank Mike for teaching Wednesday night. If you weren't here Wednesday night, you missed something. And if you go to the internet, you will still miss half of it because the sound was off to the 30-minute mark, so 28-minute mark or whatever it is. So, <laughs> <laughs> confessions from the upper room <laughs> but however he will have many more chances to teach here so uh, we've already talked about giving him a, a good easy book to do since he already mastered in James we'll give him James <laughs> I'm just messing with him. so um, let's pray father we thank you for this morning the blessings of a beautiful day that we can spend together a body of believers to search your word to grasp what you have to say, to, especially at this time period, to various people groups, that as, as the Messiah had come to rule and to reign and was rejected, Father, we see, we see this uh, culminated in different groups. And as he teaches his disciples how to live by faith, help us to have the same uh, understanding, help us to grasp what he's teaching here. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we have in verse 29... Well, actually, let's go above this. Go back to 21, and what will set the stage. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. So Jesus is, had gone off into Tyre and Sidon, and that is a predominantly Gentile area, which is 60 miles, give or take, um, from where he had been. North, uh, how did I say it last week? West, uh, west northwest of the Sea of Galilee, and that's where he was at that time. And he had ministered uh, to, uh, was ministering to these people. And this is where he met the Syrophoenician woman, the Gentile or Canaanite woman. And she calls, basically calls herself a dog. So let's, before we even read anything in here, we set the stage. I want to do some review of where we're at. Because there's a transition that happens in 15 that happens here in verse 21 that we're going to continue in 29 and don't pick up again to 16.1. Here's what happened. Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees and scribes and will be confronted by the Sadducees who had traditions that they held to a higher standard than the Word of God. Then at some point, Jesus, after he confronts them, he's, he leaves that arena. We'll talk about that again a little bit this morning. This led to a direct confrontation with the Lord who held fat, and he has many confrontations with the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees. Remember, this is the leadership of Israel they not only uh, control the religiosity of the Jewish people, but they also control the political scene. Even though Rome is ruling, they still run the politics. So um, if you want to see a good picture of mixing politics and religion, there you have it. Uh, with both these groups, specifically, we'll see with the Sadducees. That's why they were sad, you see? Yeah, right? Oh, oh. Um, but here's what happened. They held fast, the scribes and Pharisees held fast, to their tradition while at the same time transgressing the very law of God because they put that place of tradition higher than the word of God, which we know as the tradition was the oral laws. And that's what they had elevated to that and therefore lowering God's laws to a, a, a totally different place, um, which basically nullifies the law. Because we know from James that if you break the law in any place, you've broken the whole law. So that's where they're at. And they were making up their own law so they could look good on the outside and put a yoke of bondage on the people. That's, those are all the things that are going on. So he calls them a number of times hypocrites. What a perfect picture of a hypocrite. Someone who's play acting, acting a part. Not in reality, but just doing their role as they can to hold a place that they are better religiously, that they're better socially, they're better politically than anybody else, and you would see them probably, why many of us have seen, I don't even know if they're, no, I don't have one up there. 
There is a picture, there's plenty of them around that people make artistic renditions of these guys. They're dressed really in regal clothes. They, they stand out in front of normal, because remember that society back then had two levels of income, poor and rich, and that was it. it that's why Jesus says the comparison's always poor and rich. There wasn't like the middle class kind of thing. So. But as we look at this, the truth was what defiles a man is what comes out of his mouth. Uh, Old Testament foods, although unclean, they didn't defile a man. What it, what, when we're talking about defiling a man, the Pharisees had stretched uh, to a point of no return. They had said, did you wash your hands? That's where this all began, with washing your hands. And in Acts 11, 8, the Pharisees uh, basically, uh, Peter even recognizes that the foods are not the problem. The foods are not the problem. The problem is what, what you're, who you are as a person. Remember, ceremonially, they didn't have to do anything anymore. Jesus, Jesus was going to die on the cross and that ceremony would be taken care of. So the Pharisees picked on unwashed hands. Uh, again, I'm going to say this multitude of times. I don't know the paradigm of how, how much this had gone around. I mean, how many people had unwashed hands? I don't know if they had signs in the public bathroom, wash 20, you know, 20 seconds to the elbow kind of thing. Um, but it seems like the Pharisees, and I'm going to say this again, were camo Pharisees. They were stalking Jesus and his disciples, so they were closely watching everything they did. And I don't know about you all, I would be really, really upset if somebody was watching every little thing I had done. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't know about you all, I'm good maybe twice a day, okay? The rest of the time, you're going to find me messing up. And people will say things to me, and I've had this happen numerous times, and you're a preacher? Yes, I am. It doesn't say perfect preacher. It says a preacher kind of thing. So here's the thing. They had, the Pharisees had a moral standard, but they, uh, they didn't put their words to it. Their words weren't behind it. They just had a moral standard that they made up, and they said, here's the paradigm. Meet this st standard. If you meet this standard, you're okay with what? And Jesus will say, had said this before, be careful of your righteousness having that st standard of the Pharisees. The Pharisees' righteousness was horrible. That's Matthew 6, 1. So be careful of that standard of righteousness because here's why. They made up a standard that wasn't a godly standard. And that's important for us to see. We also can add to this, they were considered spiritually blind. Jesus will call them spiritually blind and that they will be blind guides leading the blind into the pit of hell. So no matter what they're doing, they're just doing. Uh, so the problem was their focus was not on the, the washing of hands as, as much as it was on what works they did and not what words they held to. Did I say that too fast? It wasn't about the wor uh, words they held to. It was about the works they were doing. They wanted approval for what they did. And they were doing it, they said, for God. And Jesus says, um, which is interesting, go back to verse 5 of chapter 15. Well, let's go to 4. For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. That's, that's get right out of the Old Testament laws. So what's he saying? And I think he's saying clearly, you guys don't even know how to honor your mother and father. Here's why. Because you say, whoever shall say to his father or mother, anything of mine you might be, have been helped by has been given to God. Wow, that is so saintly, isn't it? Everything I have, I've donated, I've given to God and God's use, and when God needs it, he'll do what? He'll send me a text, right? And I can't use it for mother and father. They need groceries. They need to be honored with help for rent or whatever it is. I can't do that. It's all been put away for God in case God needs it. And that was a loophole they made in the law that wasn't ever there. And it's really good to protect your 401k from your parents, right? Put in there, benefactor, God. Okay? And that's what they're doing. They're making up something. And Jesus says uh, he is not to honor his father, verse 6. He is not to honor his father and mother. And thus you have invalidated, listen, you've invalidated, you made the word of God null and void because of your tradition. That means you've taken your tradition and you've thrown this into the fire kind of idea. 
And that's just that's that's the hideousness of what these guys were like. And since they were like this, they represented the people. What they thought the people would end up thinking, because people are what? Really robotic. People want to be told what to think. And it's really rare to find a group of people that say, uh, you know, I can think this through. I could read this through. I can grasp this myself. I don't need you to tell me what it says. So go back to chapter 12. Again, for what we're doing is setting up 15. Chapter 12, verse 24. So this is what the Pharisees were like. This is where they were spiritually, okay? Jesus is on the scene. Jesus is doing everything to prove that he is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. He's held to every standard that the Old Testament predicted. He is the Messiah. All they have to do is what? Believe. That's it. Thank you. Believe. That's all they have to do. So here's what the Pharisees said, but in verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, that he was casting out demons out of a demon-possessed man. They, uh, they said, they said, this man, notice that what it says, this man, casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. So it goes into a discussion, like, well, why would Satan cast out Satan kind of idea. So they were saying he was casting out demons because he was satanic. And I, you need to remember this because this is so interesting. There's no proof to that. There's no proof to that. First of all, I believe, and I probably stand alone, he's one of the only people that ever cast out demons, because why? Most of us couldn't recognize a demon from a bad Joe kind of thing. I, wouldn't, I couldn't say, that's demonic, and put that on it, because there's enough things around us that are demonic today without putting the title of demonic on it. And demonic is taking the word of God and, and misrepresenting it, misinterpreting it. That's, to me, more demonic than demon possession but here's the thing Jesus has claimed to be God let's let's focus on this Jesus has claimed to be God it's not not that he didn't and he said I am been sent by the father so he's representing the father and they're saying no you don't you represent Satan there's nothing more evil than what we're seeing here in this page nothing more evil to say yes you're God no you're not you're satanic you say that but we're saying you're just a man who is casting out demons. Now, here's the interesting thing. They said he cast out demons. So it was done. It was done. I've read through my Bible a number of times, 66 books. You guys do that? You guys read through the 66? How many demon-possessed people have you seen cast out by anybody? We don't ever see it until what? Time of Jesus and, and somewhere into the time of the, the apostles, very shortly, and then it's gone, okay? Very few accounts of this, right? So any account outside of that, there's really no proof. It's, it's kind of hearsay, but they said he did this. Now look over at verse 34. Now Jesus says to them, you brood of vipers. You know what he's saying to them? You sons of Satan. Satan was the snake, the deceiver, right? He says, you brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? So Jesus calls it like it is. Jesus was not, what did we call it? Politically correct. It, his words wouldn't go over well today because they would say something like, uh, that's your truth, not our truth. It's not a real truth. It's, and Jesus is saying, this is the truth. This is the reality. You are a brood of vipers. You speak evil uh, about what is good. For the, mouth, for the mouth speaks out of which it fills the heart. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good. The evil man out of what his... Out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. So it's real easy to tell where someone's at. Listen to them talk. And that's what Jesus is saying. You, I've listened to you guys talk. You're evil. And just keep this in your, for, in your framework as we go through 15 and 16, specifically when we get into 16. These guys are evil. There's nothing else you could do with them. Uh, and now, will some Pharisees come to the Lord? Someone please say yes. Okay, I'm going to give you a quick test. Name one. Paul, Nicodemus, one more. There you go. Joseph of Arimathea. Those are basically the ones we definitely know about. Okay, so there are Pharisees that come to the Lord, but as a group, eh, not going to happen. Not going to happen. 
and they, re they will remain antagonistic to the whole big whole idea of Jesus and the beginning of the church and they're constantly there in the forefront of everything so the Pharisees therefore understood Jesus and were offended by him so they understood what Jesus was saying but they stumbled over Jesus they were offended by his words and what he was doing which basically puts them in the framework of being judged Jesus was judging them because of what they were standing for and what they were doing the disciples then now in the paradigm we're dealing with the disciples need a lesson on faith because Jesus is in about a year from the cross he's got all this antagonism going against him and we know something else I didn't put in my notes that they're out to destroy him they're gonna find a way to destroy him and he cannot be destroyed by the Pharisees because the Pharisees only killed people for certain things were only allowed to put certain people to death and it was by stoning Jesus could not be stoned. He had to be put on a cross. So he had to do certain things to avoid the crowds, the masses, and the leadership that was at that time that was causing, that wanted to destroy him. So think, these guys are never going to ask Jesus a question without the motive of trying to find fault with him and put him to death. We good with that so far? Look at chapter 16, verse 1. We're not getting there this morning, but we will at some point. And I just want you to see this, because this is what happens from this point on. Okay, this is the next time we pick up with the Pharisees. Now they now they join hands with somebody in verse in 16:1. They join hands, and it says, um, "And the Pharisees and Sadducees came up to Jesus." Now they're joined together, two groups that hate each other. The enemy of my enemy is my enemy, kind of thing. They join hands together, and here's what they're going to do. They came up testing him. Now, the idea of this kind of a test is to put him to the test to prove who he is so that he will fail. This is not a, I'm going to test your knowledge so you can pass the test. This is so I'm going to test you to prove you're not who you are so we can do exactly what we're trying to do is put you to death. Look at chapter 19. So you can know what's going on. This is just a couple of examples of what's going on at this time. Chapter 19 is another account when they come up to him. It says, and it came about, verse 1, that when Jesus finished the, these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Now, this is when he's getting closer to Jerusalem, closer to the cross. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them. And some Pharisees, uh, if you have a New American Standard, it should say some in italics. I think that's an editorial problem. Pharisees came up. How many were there? There's always some. Sometimes more than some, and other times more, many more than the other some. <laughs> we don't have any idea. Pharisees is plural. That's all it means. The Pharisees came up to him, and here's the point, testing him. Same idea. They're testing him, not questioning. You know, listen, if I could meet Jesus, I'd ask him biblical questions so he can answer them. Hey, Lord, I'm having a problem with this verse. Can you help me out? You understand the difference, right? I, I want information. They're testing him because they've already have preconceived information. They already want to put him to death. And here's what they're going to do. We're going to find out where you're wrong. So they're going to ask him the craziest question on divorce, right? Because everybody's got issues with divorce. And we're going to prove that Jesus is wrong because he's going to break everything in our tradition and biblically if we just ask him a loaded question. And Jesus, what? Double cocks his 12 gauge and and lets off uh, on these guys. So we'll deal with that when we get that get there. But I just want you to see this. So Jesus, last point of introduction. I know it's a long introduction. Um, he goes to the Gentiles now. So we're in chapter 15 and he's in a Gentile area, which is kind of interesting because when we started the book of Matthew, we said Matthew is a book to the Jewish people about their king. But that's an interesting thing because he's not just king over Israel, which he will be, and we know that. He's also, he's also going to be king of the whole entire world. And to the Gentiles, and we could just do this mentally, Jesus is going to the nations here. The idea is he's, he's reaching out to the, not only the Gentiles, but um, and the first one he meets is a God-fearing Gentile woman, so she's probably close to being a proselyte coming into Judaism, because that's how you're going to meet the Lord at this time. Um, 
who had great faith. And I think this is fascinating because it says she had great faith in the face of his disciples who had little faith. Keep that in mind. He's trying to grow the disciples' faith, and he has a wonderful uh, narrative that we have here of him going to this Gentile woman, dealing with her demon-possessed daughter, and she has great faith. She says, I'm just a dog. I want crumbs off the table. Simplistic as that could be, and the disciples never figured out where to get bread for a while, and we're going to have a bread incident when we get to chapter 16. Wow, actually, we got a bread incident after we deal with the few verses here in chapter 15. Um, but this Gentile woman was a dog who was shown mercy. Now we focus on another lesson of faith. We're going to look at further healing in verse 29, Matthew 15, 29, and then we're going to see the feeding of the 4,000 Gentiles, which is really fun. Here's what, I, what you should do when you go home. Read the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 14. Read the feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 14 and compare them. So that's an interesting read, right? Right off the bat, you know what? I've already said it. Off the bat, you know what? Difference in numbers. <laughs> that was easy, okay? But I'm saying there's a lot of comparisons, and we'll try and do some of them that, are, that I feel is important, but we'll look at this. So according to Mark chapter 7, verse 31, when we get to verse 29, Jesus is now in an area called the Decapolis. Now, there's a couple of Decapolis because it's real easy. Decapolis is a place where 10 cities are put together. This particular Decapolis is now probably on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus has left the Tyre and Sidon area. He's walked all the way to about 70 miles to Decap some, somewhere in the Decapolis. It doesn't say what city per se, um, but we know this is a Gentile area run, run by the Roman government. So he's in that area, um, and, and um, he's going to do a few things here that we see. He's, he's moving around a lot, and I think part of it is because as he moves in these particular areas, the Pharisees and Sadducees and all the Jewish leadership won't follow him. God forbid we should step on Gentile t uh, sand kind of thing, so they don't, they don't follow him. So he's got, he's got a little bit of um, breathing room for a little bit from these guys. Again, the reason is he's not trying to run away from them. He's trying to make sure he goes to the cross at the appropriate time, and they want to put him to death with a different way of putting him to death. And I think that's important for us to see. So he goes to this Gentile area, uh, 10 cities. These 10 cities today, it's no, that area is known as Jordan. So you guys can kind of picture it in your head. Uh, I think I've given you enough pictures of Jordan, but just think of a beach, a bad-looking beach. Everything's the same color, sand. That's it. It was really good. They went to Sherwin-Williams. They picked out a color and said, we want sand. <laughs> and they painted everything. It looks like sand. You know, you look out your window at a hotel, and everything looks different colors, different shades of sand. Um, the reason I'm bringing that up is because it is – Still an area that's very destitute, has issues politically and, and everything else, and still doesn't, there's a hatred for Israel, somewhat. At least there's a peace between them some, for a while, at least. Um, and, and I've read places where people say, now Jesus is wandering back in a Jewish area. If that's a Jewish area, I have, I have issues with that, always have. It is, it is not, um, because we could see that. So I, I'm going to give you a little hint. Um, how do you get rid of stalkers? Don't go in their area. The, you see, Jesus is trying to get rid of these stalkers, but I'm going to show you what happens. It's kind of interesting because he's going to minister to these Gentiles in the same way he did to the Jews. So he's going to heal. Verse 29 says this, 15, 29, And departing from there, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up there to the mountain, he was sitting there. Um, I find this fascinating, but I'm going to read the next two verses. We'll go back to 29. Verse 30 says, And great multitudes came to him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, dumb, and many others. And they laid them down at his feet, and he healed them, so that the multitude marveled as they saw the dumb speaking, the cripple restored, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So uh, we, we'll see pretty interesting things from this. So Jesus went up to the mountain. I could have left it there, and I would be happy with Jesus going up to the mountain. Jesus sat down on that mountain. The Greek reads, the Greek reads, so if we went to the Greek text and looked it up, 
It says he was sitting there in the middle voice for his benefit. He was sitting there for his benefit. He was taking what we know as what? A break. He was, he was on break. If you want to know if God takes a break, he did. Okay? He's basically on a break. Um, but if we read it without this phrase, look at this. It says, in departing from there, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee and having gone up into the mountain. Kind of reads for We know what he did. He went up in the mountain. But here's the fascinating thing. When Jesus does this, in Matthew 14, 23, he says he went up alone to pray. Pretty descriptive, right? He went up alone to pray. In 17, 1, he goes up on a mountain with Peter, James, and John at the transfiguration. He's not alone. He's got the, the uh, trifecta there that we'll talk about when we get to Matthew 17. In Mark 3, 13, he goes up to the mountain and he appoints 12 disciples. In Luke 9, 28, he goes up alone and he prays with Peter, James, and John who don't make it through the prayer meeting. I don't, I don't know how long a prayer meeting was, but they, they thought it was siesta, not prayer. Uh, in John 6, he sat down on the mountain with his disciples. This is the only place in the text he sits alone. I don't know, that just kind of fascinated me. Uh, as we look at these things, because when we look at this text, in these three verses, here's what's silent. And we got to be careful when we make assumptions about Scripture, but there's no disciples in the picture that we know of. The disciples aren't there. How did Matthew get this information? May have been there, but it's not part of the account. We know the Pharisees and Sadducees sure weren't there because it was a Gentile area. How do I know this? How do I know it's really a Gentile area? Look at the last words of verse 31. Verse 31 says, and they glorified the God of Israel. I don't think that had to be said about Jewish people. They were supposed to be do doing that, right? They should be doing that. So when it says that, it's saying these were Gentiles now glorifying the God of Israel. And, and we'll look at that as we get there. But I, I think it's a, a list somewhat odd that he's alone. He has no adversaries. He has no prayer time that he's doing, no disciples. He's just sitting there. I'm at the age right now, I can't sit too long. You, you, anybody with me? I want to be doing something. I want to do something. I want to get something done. I always have a list of things that I, I got. I have a list that's called the Eric Honey Do List, okay? Not my honey doesn't give it to me. I do it myself, and I say, I got to get these things done. And if I'm sitting for too long, I'm saying, I could have got this done, okay? But Jesus was doing something most of us don't do. He was alone, and he was quiet, and he was sitting. And I think it's interesting because there's nothing here that doesn't depict some kind of solitude. And I think that's important because word has been spreading throughout not every, all of every region he's gone to that thousands continually show up. And thousands, here's what they want. They want physical bread. They don't care about the spiritual bread. And you've got to keep that in your mind because he just fed 5,000. He fed that 5,000. They were satisfied. What a great lunch. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full, proving to the disciples what Jesus could do, that he could provide the needs of people. But the bread, the physical bread, was supposed to represent what he could do spiritually. How many of them went to him spiritually? Now we have a group of people coming to him. What are they coming for? Let's make a good observation. They're coming to get spiritual food. No, they're bringing all their infirm. I'm thinking, what kind of society is this? They're, they're, and we know there's a multitude because it says in verse 32, the multitude was marveled. I don't know what constitutes a multitude. I know it's more, let's see, a couple is two or a pair is two, then a few is three. You know, you go that way and they say, what's a multitude? I think it's thousands, okay? And we will see thousands that will accumulate by the feeding of the 4,000 plus, okay? So there's a lot of people bringing, and here's what they're bringing. Lame, crippled, blind, dumb, and many others. The wretched, we would call this, and, and understand where I'm at, in that time in society, that was the wretched of society. And in order to fix society, you make them healthy so they can get a job. And so, I know this is going to sound terrible. So they get a job so they can feed themselves and take care of themselves and automatically get off welfare. Somebody's going to can this whole day. 
He's saying get a job and get off welfare. Yes, get a job. I mean, there's some people in society I obviously need it because Jesus isn't here healing everybody, okay? Um, but here's what we have. We have Jesus alone, and thousands start to show up. And I believe this is maybe, possibly on his thought, because we just left that narrative. He, he, he had this interesting moment with this Gentile woman who, who had, he said, had great faith. And she was a dog. She called herself a dog. A lowest in society, and some of you have pets and think highly of them. It's still a dog. I don't know what else to do with it. It's still a dog. Um, and she's just saying, I'm the lowest in society. I just want scraps off the table. But he had not found that kind of faith in all of Israel. Here's a lady, a lady that was Gentile that never followed Jesus, maybe followed along and heard certain things because she's probably, again, in a different region, they weren't following Jesus as closely. Jesus was pro mostly in the Galilean region at that time, and they're 60 miles off. And she has great faith. But he doesn't have, and we, I know there's not really a big break here. It says in verse 29, he was sitting there in verse, verse 30, great multitude came. Like, how long did that take? How long was he sitting there for? When did the multitudes arrive? And I kind of think... Somebody had either a scout or somebody running advanced to find out where Jesus is at. Because how did all of a sudden a multitude, hey, Jesus is hanging out at the 7-Eleven over on Main and 8th kind of thing, and everyone starts going, let's go find him. And they're dragging, dragging, carrying, hauling people that are infirmed. Because know what they can get from Jesus? Compassion. So these multitudes start to arrive, bringing with them these various sorts of people that need healing. Now, it's interesting because it says they were laying them down at his feet. I don't know if that's figurative or literal. Because thousands of people brought people that were needed healing, and I don't think Jesus had thousands of people, right? So it's kind of figurative, but it's literal because they put him in a place where they would worship him at his feet. Just kind of picture it for a minute. Think of, he's up on the mountaintop, the, uh, the hillside that's there, and they're laying people down all around him to heal them. They, would, they just want him to do, and imagine this scene. All these people with various maladies who could scarcely move around without some kind of aid in a ray around Jesus' feet on that mountaintop. Get that picture? Jesus' healing ministry, this is fascinating, had become well-known. So well-known, at some point, Luke stopped being a doctor and became a historian because he had no job. Nobody was showing up to get the magic elixir that Luke would mix up because he, he, they didn't need it. So Jesus' ministry had brought people even from a Gentile region out to him, and even though he sought solitude, they found him, these thousands upon thousands, and it says he healed them. I think that's interesting, because this was a healing event. I don't know how it was done. Scripture's silent, but the way the Greek reads, it was, it's in the aorist, aorist tense, which means it's an event. So Jesus had a true healing, what is it called? Tent meeting kind of idea. Where it was true, listen, it was truthfully, he healed these people and verifiable. If you add up these maladies, it's, inter it's interesting to see what, if any faith healer today could do any of them, which they cannot. They feel, they heal things of goofy things that they make up kind of thing. But here's the thing we've got to remember. For someone to be healing with all the th other things Jesus has, that's the credentials of the Messiah. Messiah would come and take care of the blind, the lame, so on and so forth out of Isaiah 35. Let's look at the word. The word in Greek is where we get our word therapy from, therapeutics, that kind of idea. So Jesus was healing. We could say it like this. Jesus was not only healing, he was therapeutically caring for the people. So whatever the individual need was, he saw it and met it. So even though we have a list of maladies here, there was probably more than just those maladies. And he took care of them all. So the results are in verse 31. 
And I find it interesting. The first result we have is not that they were healed. The first result we see is that the, the crowds marveled or became astonished. And we got to ask ourselves, why were they astonished? Why were they marveling? Because uh, here's why. They actually saw, listen, they saw the dumb speaking, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's like getting on the phone and say, you, well, not with FaceTime, because we do that now. You're looking good. You're on the phone. Now, if you're on FaceTime, you can say, you're looking, no, don't do FaceTime. Close. <laughs> But we, we say, we, so to say that is kind of interesting. They saw, and what this idea of seeing is, and I think this is important for you to understand, this idea of seeing is, again, what Jesus is kind of harping on with the disciples and the crowds. Some of them see without seeing. Some of them can see physically. But where's their spiritual eyesight at? See, what's missing, and sometimes we miss this because we look at the, wow, what a great miracle. How many miracles did Jesus do that day? How many th things of healing? I have no clue. But I'm sure whoever showed up was healed. Because it says that, let's look, the, the dumb speaking, he, they saw the dumb speaking, they saw the lame walking, the blind seeing. They saw that. They saw that. But I saw what's missing. What's missing? There wasn't one spiritual idea that was met. We don't see anybody saying, and they came to the Lord. It says they glorified him, which we'll talk about in a minute. They glorified him. But we've got, we've got to say, what were they going there for? They were seeking only one thing. Fix me physically, not fix me spiritually. That was the initial thing they were going for. And they marveled at that. You know, there was even, according to the Greek, when it says they were crippled, the word there is maimed. They might have even had no limb. And Jesus, and it's the word restored, it says crippled, restored, was basically put the limb back on. Can't do that on TV today. Jesus made these people healthy. Gave them back their lives. Gave them back everything they needed to be a whole person again, so they didn't need someone else's aid and help. And the only verb in this whole sentence is they glorified or were glorifying the God of Israel. So let's put this to part, uh, uh, kind of together a little bit. Let's talk, talk about the word glorify. Doxazo is where we get our doxology from. You, know, you all remember singing doxology once in a while? I think we sung it here in the last two years once or something. But it's talking about praise or paying honor to someone, giving them homage, to adorn or clothe them with glory or splendor or luster, celebrating the value and nature of someone or something. I always look at the word glory as, as, as if a light, a spotlight is shining in that one person alone. And how do you do that? You focus on them alone and focus on who they are alone. And since it's in the aorist active indicative, this was an event, an event in celebration of the God of Israel. This is an event in the celebration of the God of Israel. Yes, and to, to the, the Jewish people, it was Jesus too, those that believe. It was the God. Listen, in the Old Testament, when it uses words, the God of Israel is always Jesus, always the second person, the Chinese God. It's always Jesus. Okay, he's the God of Israel. And, it, and we could probably spend time doing that, but yes. No, because I'll show, I'll, tell, I'll show you why. Hang on. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> the, and getting to what Rick is saying, the God of Israel's use, the phrase is used 200 times in the Bible. 200 times. Only two times in the New Testament. Only two times, and it's always in this kind of a, well, actually here in Mark, in the same atmosphere. So my immediate thought is the context. This Gentile crowd is celebrating the God who is the God of Israel. They understood that. So they came there initially to have their physical needs met, and they were. Listen, Jesus doesn't go to anything like this and participate in anything without teaching too. So when he taught and how he taught, we don't know. 
but they did get this idea. And the link, though, here's what they're recognizing. These Gentiles recognize that Jesus is also to our nations, not just to, the, not to a specific nation alone. It's, he is the God of Israel, but he's come to us too. So, what I got of this is interesting. Because Israel wasn't saying this at the time. He, they weren't saying as a nation, he is our God. They were saying he's what? They were following after the Pharisees, that he is uh, motivated by Beelzebub. He's satanic. But I'm going to say this, and this is an important factor. For Israel to believe their God is it, that their God is Jesus, who was the God of Israel, is the most natural of things, because even these Gentiles saw him and said he is the God of Israel. For the surrounding nations to believe that he's God of Israel is probably the most blessed event you could see in the Bible. They recognize Jesus as the God of Israel. How often is that taught in church today? Is he your God? Is he my God? Which is fine. He's still the God of Israel, which brings a lot of the Old Testament right here. Right? So the question I have, and it is there, it's an open question, and the reason I say that is because we're going to see an incident that happens right after this, so I'm trying to put all the context together, not just sticking here, because verse 32 picks up with this also, and we're going to get into it a little bit. But the unifying factor that we have so far, the unifying factor, is that both the Gentile and Jew come to the Lord in the same way. Isn't that the most unifying thing? He does the same thing for them that he was doing to Israel. He was, he was pointing out his credentials as Messiah, and they recognized his credentials. Now, the question is, did they come with their sin and lay it before his feet? I don't know. They recognized this, and they were, they, listen, people can glorify the Lord, call him who he is, and not believe still. The incident that's missing is where is their belief? They just said they glorified him. That means, here's what it's saying. They shined a spotlight on Jesus saying he's the God of Israel. You get the picture. It doesn't mean they had any belief. And the next section, which ties into this, will show where is their faith. And not only theirs, but the disciples too. So let's kind of look at verse 32 and kind of jump into 32 a little bit. 15, 32. And this is why I think the disciples weren't even there, because it says in verse 32, and Jesus called his disciples to, to him. So now he's got to call them. I don't know. They may have been in the crowd. Listen, when you study the Bible, you say, this is possible and probable, maybe not. But he's calling them to him. He's beckoning them to him. So, and I believe, even though we go from 31 to 32, this is a separate occasion. I don't know what, how much time transpired. I believe it's the same region. I think it's the same group of people. I think it's a similar multitude. Now that multitude is what? Healed. We're not going to deal with a healing per se. Um, so we, had, we do have a separate occasion. Look at Mark. Hold your finger here. Go to Mark chapter 8. Some of you should be in 7 because I told you to go there. Let's go to 8, though. Mark 8. Mark 8, verse 1, it says, in those days again, so, so Mark is kind of giving you, he's already dealt with the further healing, which is a little bit different because of Mark, Mark 7, I forgot to bring this up, Mark 7, verse 31 through 37 is, is, a, is the same event, Here's the, listen, this is so cool, Mark, it, but he's not dealing with the crowd, he's dealing with one person in the crowd. So Jesus heals the crowd, but in Mark 7, something stuck out. And I believe Peter motivated Mark to write this. So something stuck out that Peter got an understanding from this incident, and some one person stuck out. Okay? So when we get to verse eight, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, in those days again. That means there's a time factor here of an elapse of time between both instances. Okay? I don't know how long. Uh, I would say a couple days maybe, because here's what happens. This is when there was a great multitude, they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the multitude because they have remained with, with me now three days and have nothing to eat. So there's a three-day lapse of time. 
So if you're doing comparisons, 5,000 one day, 4,000 with Jesus three days. There's a difference in days. I'm not going to give them all to you, but we will deal with that. So go back to 15. So he says he has compassion. Verse, verse 32, I felt compassion for the multitude. That's an interesting word. So I wanted to do a whole dissertation on, on feeling compassion because that's an interesting idea. Jesus just healed them. There was no idea of compassion in that narrative, was there? There wasn't anything. Now all of a sudden I feel compassion on them because they've remained with me now three days and they're hungry. Wait a second. What's better for you or me, having my legs replaced or having a sandwich? Kind of, you know, I mean, three days without eating to some people is a lifetime. And to others, it's like, okay, I can deal with this. Jesus fasted for how what, 40 days, 40 nights? I can do a Jesus fast. No, you can't. <laughs> Try it, because all you're going to think about is what? Food. <laughs> I've made it six hours and I need lunch. You know, it's like 40 days. But they've gone without through. And he says, I have compassion for them. Splanka nidzomai. Splanka nidzomai. It's a big word in Greek. Okay? Here's some things about the word. It's only used 12 times in the New Testament. I found this fascinating. It's never used outside of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Never outside those three books. It's not used in John or any of the New Testament books. Never. And guess who's always the subject of the one who felt compassion? Jesus. Only Jesus had this type of compassion. So splanka, listen, splanka, the, the root of this word, has to do and refers to your internal organs, such as your heart, your liver, your lungs, your guts, <laughs> your inner parts. They were all regarded by the Greeks as the site of your emotions which is fascinating because we're always talking here about think it through, don't get emotional, yet at the same time to Jesus seeing these people, it was an emotional turmoil that he had in his guts. It was gut-wrenching. We could even put it down like that. Compassion is the idea of, or showing compassion was typical of Jesus along with him moving not only to feel that gut-wrenching moment, but he moved to, listen, do something about it. So some of you say, Do you have, don't you have compassion for somebody? You're actually trying to tell them to have a Jesus-like moment, to feel gut-wrenching thing, and to do something, not to just meet the need, to, but to exceed the need. And I will say this. if we, we are very short of ever having the compassion Jesus had. Here's why. Because the very character of the Lord, who, clear, who, who most clearly at the cross where God the Father in Christ dying on the cross took an action on behalf of the lost and dying world and it drove him to love the world, love all of mankind, and to have compassion on them. See, the cross is the greatest picture of compassion. He saw a need. You all with me? God saw a need of the entire world. For God so loved the what? World. Not just the believer, right? God saw the entire mankind. From Genesis to Revolution, right? Genesis, God saw all of mankind, and he had compassion on them. The only way he can meet the problem of that compassion was to put his son on the cross. Did that meet or exceed the need? Far exceeded the need, right? And I think one of the, if you understand that idea, John 3, 16 becomes such a bigger picture, Right? So in verse 32, just a few more minutes, and we're going to, I eat coffee, so I don't know what you guys need. So he felt this compassion because the crowd had remained with him. Now, I don't know about you all. Some of you I'm already losing, okay? I haven't even got an hour, so, and I don't have compassion for you. <laughs> I'm not going to meet or exceed any need you might have. I can see. Listen, I think it's fascinating. These people hung out for three days and know what Jesus was doing? He was no longer healing because they had been healed. He's teaching them. How many of you can make it through a three-day sermon? And you say, well, it was the Lord. I'd sit through his sermon. No, you wouldn't. 
Especially if you were what? Hungry. Who said that? Hungry. How many of you listen real well when you're starving? <laughs> it's like, I, I shut down. I need at least a bowl of popcorn during a movie, right? Can't even make it through a movie because my brain's shutting down. I'm like, I just need to feast on something. Okay? That's why concession stands make a fortune. Because <laughs> they know you can't, you can't do it. <laughs> But I think it's fascinating. Here's what he's doing. He has compassion on this crowd because they have been with him for three days. And they haven't eaten. They haven't taken a break. I'm sure there was break times, okay? But he says, I, his compassion, listen, is twofold here. They had been with him for three days and hadn't eaten anything. And he had a wish, a desire. He didn't want to send them away hungry. Why? I think it's kind of funny. Because on the way, they would faint. They'd go home. Now, I don't know if you guys understand this picture. Most of you drove here, and it was like a 10-minute drive, 5-minute drive, whatever. It's like an air-conditioned car. You didn't feel the heat. You walked out of the car, and you go, oh, it's so hot. You got in the building so much better. So you had the three-second walk to, from, building, from car to building, and you go, so hot. These people walked every, almost everywhere they went. They walked. And it was so hot. And you would send them without food. They would drop on the road. Kind of get the picture? And he didn't want to do that. He wanted to give them substance. So if they did go home, they would be well-fed spiritually and physically. Because you listen better on a, on a full stomach and awake. I don't know anybody that slept through a sermon that could tell me exactly what I said. I did have people, I have been, listen, I got to share this with you. One lady slept through a whole sermon. At the end, she got back to the back door, and she goes, you did a really good job. I go, so did you. We were talking about two entirely different things. <laughs> but I think it's funny because people think, oh, I only slept for a few minutes. No, you made it almost a whole class. <laughs> did a good job, kind of thing. But, but here's where we're at. He wanted to make sure his compassion for them was he wanted to meet the need and exceed the need, and he didn't want them fading or being become despondent on the way home. And this all dro drove Jesus' compassion, which was gut-wrenching. So, let's hang on this for the next class, okay? Ready for this? The other side of the coin is Jesus taught at every possible moment. So this crowd had not, only, had not taken a break for three days, and they are about to get bread from heaven, a heavenly source, right? You need to keep this focus. When we get to 16, you want to look at the Pharisees and say, what? Anyway, they've got bread, the manna we talked about, the manna from heaven, from the very logos of God. He's the very word of God, giving them bread out of heaven. And we know that no man, what? Lives on bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God and they have been given red. And we'll see this as we walk in, uh, do the next part of this and go into chapter 16. So let's take a break. Let's close in prayer, and uh, we'll pick up here next class. Father, thank you for this time as we go through these accounts. Father, again, this is a faith-building event, so we could see how people had the journey of faith. Father, we see that your son was exactly who he claimed to be and provided the needs for all. In Jesus' name, amen. There is coffee in the fellowship.